uh, reinforcement learning session number 14. Uh, today we have four presentations, one long presentation and uh, three short presentations. The first presentation is R, R RL Lib abstractions for distributed reinforcement learning and uh, Eric Leung and Richard Liao are presenting. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hey, so I'm Eric and this is Richard and uh, we're here to tell you about abstractions for distributed reinforcement learning. Okay, great. Okay, so as, um, as computer scientists, we always want to be standing on the shoulders of giants, and this is true for RL research as well. Hardware today is rapidly improving in performance and cost, and we see the impact of this on research. With the many recent successes such as AlphaGo Zero, OpenAI 5, and Impala are not only driven by algorithmic improvements, but by leveraging specialized hardware and distributed computation. But hardware alone is not enough. The the field of deep learning has greatly benefited from a wealth of software frameworks, such as TensorFlow, that accelerate development and training of models. Um, in contrast, for reinforcement learning, which not only involves the training of a model, but the execution of rollouts in a cluster, management of many volatile variations, and even model-based subtasks, there is a relative lack of scalable software abstractions. And this is really unfortunate, because we see a lot of um, complexity in the computational structure of RL algorithms. And also, it seems like more algorithms are being invented every day. So if you look at what systems are available for RL today, uh, there's a lot of code out there. Um, I, th I think I counted 7,000 repos on GitHub. But the real question is, how general are these implementations, and how do they scale? And if you look at the most scalable implementations of algorithms out there, you'll find that they're implemented using many different distributed systems. For example, um, Python multiprocessing, MPI, and custom ones as well. And really, the bottom line here is that there's a huge variety of algorithms and distributed systems used to implement them, but there's not that much reuse of components. And this is actually not very surprising. There are a lot of challenges for reuse. So for example, even for one RL algorithm, there's a wide range of physical execution strategies. You might optimize for a single node versus cluster execution, uh, CPUs versus GPUs, and many other choices besides that. And the specialized systems we have today, such as parameter servers and MPI only capture a subset of this design space. Uh, we're also fortunate to have many uh, choices of deep learning frameworks, but these frameworks have different programming and parallelism paradigm. And if you can stick to, say, TensorFlow, if you write distributed TensorFlow versus TensorFlow and MPI, um, you'll find that the programming models are quite different, and uh, reusing code between these implementations can be pretty challenging. Finally, there's just a, little, there's just a large variety of algorithms with different structures. So in our paper, we looked at several different families of algorithms. And you can see that while there's many similarities between these algorithms, there's also a lot of variety, especially for the more complex distributed ones. So what we're really after is abstractions for reinforcement learning. And good abstractions let us decompose RL algorithms into reusable components. And the goals here would be code reuse across different deep learning frameworks, scalable execution, and also to make it easy to compare and reproduce the results of algorithms. Um, so before diving into abstractions, let's take a step back and look at the a classic RL training loop. So you typically have some agent that takes actions in the environment, um, gets observations, a reward, and then takes more actions. And you want your agent to learn, so of course you have some policy evaluation module that um, collects trajectories of experiences and some policy improvement operator that improves the policy based on those trajectories. And it turns out there's a lot of ways to decompose this basic loop. So let's look at one example, um, asynchronous DQN. So here you have many uh, actor learner processes that execute this loop in parallel and synchronize weights through a, a central parameter server. Um, so on the other hand, you have Apex DQN, which is a more scalable implementation of DQN. And here, the loop is broken up into two pieces. So you have many actors uh, collecting experiences in parallel. And then you have a central learner that um, just learns on the high priority experiences. Now, these two algorithms have very uh, different performance characteristics. For example, Apex can uh, outperform uh, the async TQN by an order of magnitude in, uh, in learning. However, they're really the same algorithm under the hood. So you have the exact same policy, pi theta, um, some, uh, the, the same end step DQN processor, and also the same uh, Q loss function. But there's many structural differences here. So with async DQN, you have uh, asynchronous optimization, uh, many replicated workers, and you, you're typically building this for a single machine. Uh, for Apex, you have a central synchronous learner. 
Uh, you have data queues between distributed components, larger replay buffers, and you're also you're building this for a really cluster scale. And if you're, and if you're combining um, these training things, uh, algorithms with hyperparameter training techniques, such as population-based training, now you have nested parallel computations, and then you have to make complex control decisions based on intermediate results of algorithms. And, and so far, we've only just looked at the DQN family of algorithms. What we found is that there's really no existing system out there that can effectively meet the very demands of all RL workloads. So what are the requirements for a new system? The goal here would be to capture a broad range of RL workloads with very high performance and substantial code reuse. So one requirement is we want to support stateful computations, such as simulators, uh, neural networks, and replay buffers. And it's worth noting that the, the big data frameworks we have today, such as Spark, typically assume your computation is stateless. We need to support asynchronies, which is required by um, many algorithms. And this sort of thing can be difficult to express in MPI, uh, especially if you have um, uh, complex nested or recursive computations. And we also want to allow EC composition of these distributed components. Um, so at UC Berkeley, we built a new system called Ray, which was designed from the ground up to meet these uh, new requirements. And RLlib builds on top of Ray to provide higher level abstractions for RL. So Ray implements a hierarchical parallel sta um, task model with stateful workers. And the main benefit of this model is that it's flexible enough to capture a broad range of RL workloads, um, uh, in contrast to uh, having to leverage many different specialized systems. And the way this model works is that you can create Python class instances in your cluster. So these are basically your stateful workers. And then you can schedule short running tasks onto these workers. And the, the challenge here is really achieving this with really high performance. And Ray is able to implement this model um, uh, with, at high scale with millions of tasks per second and a very low task overhead of a few hundred uh, microseconds per task. And to show this visually, say we are, uh, we are, we're a user using Ray. Um, I might create a top-level worker. That worker can create sub-worker processes of its own and, and sub-sub-workers and so on. And I say I want to execute a task. I want to run let's say, case steps of training for some algorithm. As part of that task, the top-level worker might delegate um, some sub-tasks, such as experience collection, to a sub-worker. And that sub-worker might delegate for their sort of sub-tasks. And then while that task is executing, um, perhaps the top-level worker will tell two other workers to all reduce their gradients. And those two workers can talk to each other through Ray APIs to do that. And all of this is happening concurrently in parallel. And the top level worker can decide um, to wait for some or all of these tasks to complete before issuing a new task for training. So a unified system that can execute all these different types of computations is actually really key to enabling abstractions for RL. And this is because once you can do everything in one system, um, you can actually pull out part of the distributed execution of an RL algorithm into a reusable software component. Um, uh, so this leads to the first abstraction offered by RLib, which is that of a policy optimizer. So policy optimizers are responsible for executing the distributed computation required to improve a policy. Um, so policy optimizers operate over policy graphs. You've seen one before. It's a tuple of uh, pi theta, the, the policy model, some post-processor for trajectories, and some loss function used to improve the policy. And so this policy graph encapsulates the, the core numerical computations of your algorithm. So, um, right, so you've seen one example before, which is the DQM policy graph. Uh, another example would be for the policy gradient family. Um, you have, might have an LSTM model, um, some advantage calculation function for post-processing, and then the policy gradient loss, of course, for improving the policy. So OK, so RLib decomposed the algorithms into policy optimizers and policy graphs. So let's look at how these fit together. So with that DQN policy graph we've seen before, if, we, if I use a simple synchronous replay optimizer, I end up with um, classic DQN. And just by changing the policy optimizer implementation, I can get different variations of DQN. Um, and for policy gradients, if I, again, use a very sim uh, simple uh, synchronous optimizer, I can get the vanilla policy gradient. And by adding uh, more components to the policy graph, I can get A2C, I can get PPO. And by changing the policy optimizer, I can get a GPU optimized version of PPO and A3C. And if I change um, both the policy graph, adding vtrace, and use a policy optimizer similar to that used for Apex, I can get Impala. So I think the really neat thing here is just by mixing and matching um, several standard components, we're able to rep reproduce the results of seven to eight papers, one of which I think you'll hear about in the next talk. And this is really the goal of RLibs abstractions, to make composing new algorithms very easy. 
Um, so feature-wise, RLib has many reference algorithms built using these implementations, uh, some of which are from the community. And um, all these algorithms achieve state-of-the-art performance. So for example, our evolution strategies implementation is, is able to scale up to 8,000 cores um, on the humanoid v1 task. So and this scales further, and it's also faster than the reference implementation. And then our PPO implementation uh, also scales to hundreds of cores and is faster than a uh, reference implementation in MPI. So beyond um, being a collection of algorithms, of course, uh, our libs abstractions that you easily implement and scale new algorithms. And the best way to understand this is in code. So here I'm going to hand it off to Richard for a demo. Thank you, Eric. Um, let me change this display so that we can set up for this demo. So we just heard a lot about policy optimizers and policy graphs. And a lot of you might be RL implementers in the audience, and you might be thinking, well, I already have my own code, and writing parallel code seems quite hard. So today for my demo, I'm going to show you that scaling your algorithms with RLib is actually quite easy. I'm going to start with a single-threaded A2C implementation I found on GitHub, and then I'm going to use that to define a RLib policy graph. I'm then I'm going to use a policy optimizer from RLib to scale this to four cores on my laptop, and then show you how to run it on a cluster. So to start off, I found this implementation, uh, this repository on GitHub. It's fairly popular. It has almost 2,000 stars. And uh, specifically, let's take a look at this A2C implementation. Um, notably, it uses carpool, um, which is fairly, fairly simplistic, but it's quite fast and is nice for this demo. So I went ahead and I downloaded this onto my local computer. So it's the same script. And um, one thing to note is that we actually, it uses uh, Keras to define its models. Um, this is important later on when we're going to create the policy graph. And uh, I also ran this and plotted the results on TensorBoard. And we can see that it, within 30 seconds, which is the time scale I have for this demo, it reaches a reward of uh, 90. So let's try to make this faster. So let's write some code. Uh, up here, I've already started with some boilerplate of initializing Ray. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a policy graph. So here's some boilerplate code. Um, I'm importing the A2C agent from the previous script. I'm going to be extending the Keras policy graph because uh, the previous script uses Keras. And the first thing I need to do is, in order to link this into RLib, I'll have to pull out the actor and the critic from the previous implementation. And also, in order to calculate the right targets to train the model, um, I'm going to need to use this function, uh, compute targets from RLib. And this is going to take in a trajectory object uh, in addition to the current action space. And um, a discount factor in order to calculate the right discounted rewards. So let's run this. And now that we've restructured the original implementation to use the RLDIB policy graph abstractions, let's create an optimizer and train this policy with RLDIB. So the first thing I need to do in order to create an optimizer is call the optimizer constructor. And what I'll be doing is I'll be using the sync samples optimizer. And within this, um, constructor, I'll have to pass in a few arguments, the first of which is the environment. So we're using carpool. So here we have carpool v1. I'm going to pass in this graph defined above. And finally, I'm going to set the number of uh, samples to 4,000 per iteration. And I'm going to use this helper function I writ wrote beforehand in order to run this optimizer for about 30 seconds, similar to the original implementation. And I'm going to label this as all the worker equals one. So this is going to run on a single process and evaluate each um, iteration for 4,000 steps on the environment. Now, what happens if we want to speed this up? Well, thankfully, in our lib, the only thing we need to do is use the same constructor, but add an argument, num workers 
equals 4. And we can run this or queue this run. And under the hood, our lib will spawn multiple ray actors in separate processes, each of which is running the sampling process asynchronously. And this will return the sample data to the main process. Now, another thing to note is that we're using the sync samples optimizer, but because of our lib's abstractions, you can actually change this out to any other optimizer, such as the asynchronous gradients optimizer if you want to use A3C, or async sa samples optimizer if you want to do something like Apex. And the nice thing is that you don't actually have to change your actor critic graph. All these arguments can stay the same. So let's quickly switch over to TensorBoard. And we can see that slowly we have this original implementation, which is in orange, and we have this red implementation, which is um, using four workers, and we have this middle line, which is using one worker. And a nice thing is within 30 seconds, we can see that the original implementation compared to the one single process implementation, there's a little gap due to maybe having a large batch size, but within also 30 seconds uh, using four workers, we can even further accelerate the training process. Now, so far, we've scaled to about four cores, and we're getting a result of around 300. Now, with Ray and RLib, we can actually scale to a cluster uh, by changing the argument of the number of workers uh, simply by going to something like 60. And right now I don't have time to set up a cluster, I only have one minute left, but I went ahead, ahead of time to uh, run this optimizer and um, to, let's, let's take a look at the predefined results, take a note that this is around 300 for 400, four workers, and with 60 workers we can further accelerate training from going from 300, which is around here, all the way to 450 within 30 seconds. So clearly the, the point here is that with only a small change, you can further accelerate your training, which is sometimes takes a long time in reinforcement learning. Uh, going back to the talk, in summary, RLDIP addresses challenges by providing scalable abstractions for reinforcement learning. And you can try out RLDIP for yourself by going to rlib.io. It's open source, and if you're interested, come check us out at the poster session. Thanks. Time for one question. Any questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker and move to the second talk, which is also a, a relevant talk to the, to the first one, and uh, it's called Impala, Scalable Distributed Deep RL with Importance Weighted Actor Learners Architecture, and is presented by Lasse Spohold. Hi, I'm Les. I'm uh, based in Brain Amsterdam right now, but this is work done at DeepMind together with, Thank you. with uh, Hubert Sawyer and Remy Muniz, along with a list of our excellent colleagues at DeepMind. And the code is open sourced in DeepMind's uh, GitHub repository. So the main takeaways of the paper is that we developed an inefficient and scalable debarrel agent that's both efficient on a single machine and scales to thousands of machines. This is really changing the way that researchers do research. Um, furthermore, we added a new off policy method called vtrace and a new level suite called DMLab30. And we show strong multitask performance on DMLab30 and on Atari 57. And lastly, we show that deeper networks finally works well in reinforcement learning, uh, which is taking some time. Uh, there's a bunch of related work. This is just for reference. There's related work from NVIDIA, colleagues at DeepMind, uh, Toronto, and so on. Um, so, so the problem we wanted to solve was doing 30 tasks at a human level performance with a single agent, meaning like we train all 30 tasks at the same time for 10 billion frames in total with one set of weights, one agent that does all these games. All the tasks are based on the same 3D environment, based on the Quake 3 engine with discrete actions. Um, and because it's the same environment, we will expect some kind of transfer learning between these tasks. Relatively to Atari, this is a fairly slow environment. It will take half a year to run one environment for 10 billion frames, and we don't really have time for that. Um, the metric we use to measure performance on these 
multitask set is a mean cap humanized score, which means we cap the humanized score at 100%, which encourages us to solve many games at human level performance instead of just solving a few at superhuman level performance. Um, a few commonly used policy gradient agents in, in the community are H3C and batched H2C. Well, the problem with H3C is that you have a batch size of one, which means that you can basically not use GPUs for H3C out of the box at least. Uh, it also doesn't inc uh, scale well with increasing the number of machines due to stale gradients. And handling all this threading can be a complex setup unless you have something like uh, Ray from the previous talk. Um, batch stage you see does have a batch, like a larger batch size, so you would think it should do well on the GPU, but this only applies if the environment is fast enough, so you don't spend all the time on rendering on your CPU. And it does have cleaner gradients and better convergence than HVC. So getting to Impala, we settled on a, a very simple and flexible distributed architecture where we split it up into actors and learners where the actors are running the environments and inference, and these are usually on a CPU, but they don't have to. The learners are doing the training loop on GPU, or, or TPU for that matter, um, and the actor sends observations, which includes the frames, the initial RNN state actions, and policy logics to the learner, and fetches parameters at every unroll. And this is done completely decoupled in an asynchronous manner. Uh, so if you take a look at the timeline for a popular agent A to C uh, and one training step, you can see that if, 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 if one of the environment has a slow uh, step, uh, it will affect all the samples in this batch and you effectively won't utilize a GPU for much of the time of, a, uh, of the training step. Uh, yeah, so this is like showing the synchronized per step which is the most common batch stage to see implementation. Um, an alternative is to synchronize per trajectory. So you only synchronize all the actors after they run all the trajectories. Uh, but then the forward pass is not batched. In Nepal, we do this completely decoupled between the actors and learners, which means the actors will potentially have a slightly stale policy, which makes it effectively an off policy uh, paradigm. So basically, off policy makes uh, the normal actor critic policy gradient update unstable and incorrect. So we need to do something about this. And for that, we introduce vtrace. And here we, we look at the end step um, value approximation uh, and we rewrite it using a sum of temporal differences. And these two are completely equivalent. And for vtrace, we add a, sim a few simple terms, which are products of uh, importance sampling weights. Uh, so it's very like minimal changes. Um, in, the, in the case where you actually have on policy, this will reduce to the standard actor critic policy gradient update. We do truncate the importance weights, uh, and we found that a good default is one. This does mean, however, that uh, they convert, it doesn't converge towards the target policy that we really care about, that we're optimizing on the learner, but it converges to something between the behavior policy that the actors run and the target policy that the learner runs, depending on this truncation level. Um, of course, these two policies are fairly similar. So the, the value is optimized towards the importance weighted value with an L2 loss. Um, so there's much, not much change there. The agent and networks we use output the policy and the value from a single network. We unroll it for 100 steps. And we use, we, we benchmark on two different networks, a shallow network, which is the same as a H3C paper and has been used in many different papers, which only has like two convolution layer, a feed forward layer, uh, and an LSTM. And then we also experiment with a deeper network based on ResNet v2, which has combined 15 layers of convolutions, three forward and an LSTM in the end. The inputs to these networks are the previous action, the previous reward, the LSTM state, the frame, and the text input for some of the uh, DeepMind lab levels. So looking at the performance of the shallow network, we see a few interesting things. 
Uh, first, comparing A to C and A to C, we'll see that for batch A to C, where you, you synchronize per step, you really get penalized on some tasks if there's a variance in the duration of a single step. Um, but synchronizing per trajectory for batch A to C actually makes it faster than A to C, so there's little point to actually use A to C at this point. Comparing in parallel on a single machine with dynamic batching, meaning we group the forward passes and run them on a GPU, uh, we do get a decent speed up compared to A to C. In this case, the speed up is, is limited by the number of frames we can render on a single machine. The real interesting part is the distributed setup, where with A to C, we get like 50,000 frames per second with 200 CPUs, and in parallel, we can get more than 200,000 frames per second with roughly twice the number of resources, so a 4x uh, speed up with 2x um, resources. And we'll see that the convergence is much better. So this is really something that changes the way you, you do your research. Um, so in the end, we get like a 30 times speed up compared to HVC on the single machine, and still we, we do better on the games. Looking at few single level results based on the shallow network comparing distributed Impala, batched A2C, A2C, and distributed A2C. We find that batched A2C and Impala are doing similarly, which is very encouraging, and distributed A2C fails when you increase the number of workers. Looking at a full sweep of hyperparameters, we here plot the final return of 24 hyperparameter sets and sort them from the highest to the lowest. And we find that for every single hyperparameter set, Impala and batch a to c are performing similarly and better than A3C. Comparing VTrace with a few uh, alternatives, such as a, a one-step VTrace version where we don't um, weight the traces, and a Epsilon correction, which was used in the NVIDIA GHVC paper, where they add like a small epsilon to the policy to avoid explosions when you're optimizing. And pretending, that we, and lastly, we pretend to consider the off-policy data on policy. We find that VTrace and the one-step approach are doing roughly similar and better than the, the epsilon correction and no correction. However, if we add a, a replay, like samples to the batch from a, a uniform replay, we find that VTrace is consistently the only of these approaches that uh, improves the performance compared to uh, not including any samples from replay. So going to one of the interesting multitask sets, DM Lab 30, where again we train on 30 tasks at the same time, we find that Comparing the shallow and the deep work network has a, a huge ben benefit. Uh, so finally, we have deep work networks that actually are useful in IL. And comparing with A3C, Impala and A3C, we have like a huge gap in the performance of the two algorithms. So Impala, in this case, are faster and has much better results on this task set. We also experiment with population-based training for optimizing hyperparameters uh, while we are training, and this gives us a, a, a small uh, speed up. Um, and finally, we compare with using eight GPUs, one GPU on, um, on each of eight machines, and we find that we get a, um, a seven times speed up while keeping roughly the same data efficiency. So this is like extremely good results, I think. Uh, finally, if we compare the deep network where, with an Impala version where we train an agent individually on each, each game, so we have like 30 different agents training for the same number of total frames, we find that the multitask setting does better than combining these expert trained agents, meaning that they're indicating that we do have some transfer between the levels. Looking at Atari 57, where we are training on 57 uh, games, we can have that comparing shallow and deep work network has a, a 2x uh, performance improvement, both the median and the mean uh, performance. And comparing with A3C, 
the deep network and in parallel with the deep network, we also see like a roughly a 2x performance boost. Um, and so finally, we also train Impala on a multitask setup of the 57 gigabits. So we have like a single agent training on all these 57 tasks at the same time. And we actually get like a 60% median uh, human normalized score. So we're doing fairly well in all 57 games with a single agent. And this is actually better than one of the benchmarks that many people use in the papers, which is A2C trained on the games individually. So to conclude, Impala is a large-scale distributed RL agent with state-of-the-art performance on challenging multitask tasks, uh, benchmarks, and we found it effective on a wide range of RL problems, which are highlighted by the, the recent number of um, DeepMind papers using Impala, which is shown here. Uh, and again, the code is open sourced, so please go and play with the Impala. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker and move on to the next talk. So the next presentation is uh, Mix and Match, Agent Curricula for Reinforcement Learning, and is presented by Siddhant Jayakumar. Um, hi, my name is Sid, uh, and I'm going to be presenting this work uh, entitled Mix and Match, Agent Curricula for Reinforcement Learning. Uh, this is work done jointly with the uh, authors on the screen and also work done on DeepMind. So, so to sort of start with, this work, as the name suggests, sits um, at the intersection between two important paradigms in machine learning today, uh, curriculum learning and deep reinforcement learning. Um, and so there's been tremendous success in DeepRL in the last few years. Um, there have been sort of newer algorithms, newer task sets. And one thing specifically that this has led to is sort of richer environments with complex dynamics um, as a test bed for our agents. Um, and so things like DeepMind30, um, Atari, StarCraft have really allowed us to push the frontiers of how we test our agents. But on the flip side, what it means is that we have to deal with complex training regimes, uh, larger, more complicated action spaces, larger architectures. So essentially what this means is it necessitates massively parallel architectures um, that often take billions of steps to train and aren't quite data efficient in, in, in the large scheme of things. Um, so in a nutshell, deep RL is hard. Um, and one thing we can hope is that we can borrow lessons from things that people have done previously, um, like curriculum learning, uh, and try and make this somewhat more efficient. And curriculum learning is essentially a powerful tool in the deep learning toolbox that's been used in both the supervised, unsupervised, um, and RL domains, um, where the premise is basically that to train a target network on some task that you care about, you're going to first start by mastering simpler variants of that task. Um, so this seems like a good idea. If we have an RL task that's very hard, um, and we have architectures that take a long time to train, we should start by first trying simpler variants of the task and then bootstrapping on those solutions uh, to train the, the task of, that we care about. So curriculum learning can help with the only caveat, which is how do you create simpler tasks when you don't have control over the task generation process? Um, so it's a great idea to try simpler versions of Atari, but Atari is this externally defined environment that it's not completely easy to reverse engineer and create an easier version of Pac-Man or, or an easier version of StarCraft. So the approach that we basically take in this paper is to say, let's try curricula over agents as opposed to tasks. Um, in reality, these are orthogonal approaches, and you should do both. Um, but there's been a lot of literature about how to do this in the task setting, so we focus mainly on creating and training such curricula over agents. Okay, so what do I mean by curricula over agents? So the idea is that we want some target agent, some, some model that we want to train on a task that we, um, you know, the final task uh, that we desire. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to start by training simpler versions of this agent. Um, and then bootstrap on the solutions found by that. So uh, an, an analog to what you would do with standard curriculum learning over tasks. What's important here is when I mean simpler agents, I don't just mean in terms of architectural complexity, um, but whatever the, the, the thing we're trying to optimize it. So it might be that we care about the size of the model, it might be we care about the size of the action space, um, whatever sort of the limiting factor in how hard it is to train, we try and simplify that and bootstrap from those. 
Um, so this, of course, has a lot of connections to work on. Meta learning, transfer learning, distral, um, ideas in you know, growing neural architectures, um, and there's a lot of related work in the paper. So the algorithm we propose, um, which is sort of a simple framework for doing this, is called mix and match. So this consists of two steps. In the mix step, we start by saying, OK, we have this population of k agents um, arranged in some increasing order of complexity. Um, and we're going to treat these as one single meta agent, um, which interacts with the environment. So you have a policy that is some mixture of the constituent policies of all the agents you care about. Um, and you're going to act on this with the environment. Um, and further, we're going to have this loss such that the complex agent we care about training starts by mimicking the policy of the simple agent in the curriculum. So given k agents, you're going to start by using mostly the, the smallest or the simplest agent and increasing the complexity progressively uh, to train the target agent. Sort of more concretely, mathematically, this is what that would look like. So we have this graph of a policy interacting with the environment. And here, this policy is pi mm. So pi mm is a mixture of these constituent policies that have been given. Um, and we sort of do the simplest thing possible, which is it's just a weighted sum of the policies of the agents that comprise the curriculum. In the case where alpha, uh, where k equals 2, so you just have a simple and a hard policy, um, you would just have one mixing coefficient here, alpha. Um, you, of course, want these alphas to sum to 1. Um, and then there's the associated distillation loss, which I've given here, assuming, again, that you have two agents. Um, so in this setup, you have some pi 1, which is the policy parameterized by a simpler agent. Um, and you're going to distill this policy into the more complex one, pi 2, um, by minimizing this KL divergence between the two policies at every time step over some trajectories. So there's two important things to note in this loss. Um, one is the mixing coefficients. So in this general term, we say there's going to be some alpha, but we would like the alpha such that the, the simple agent um, is first used. So you want alpha to be high at the start um, and then sort of have some sort of schedule such that you use only the complex agent at the end of training. Um, so for our experiments, what we do is we train all our agents online and end-to-end. -end. Um, in practice, mix and match can be put over any policy gradient algorithm. Um, it's just a simple framework. To tune alpha, we found that linear schedules work quite well, but you can also use population-based training, as described earlier, um, and try and get these schedules on their own. Um, and so for our experiments, we use Impala, as described earlier, as well as population-based training. Um, and we use the DMLab 30 set of tasks, which is these rich uh, environments with complex dynamics. So we focus on, on three specific use cases. One is using mix and match to scale to very complex action spaces. The second is scaling agent architectures. Uh, and we finally look at how you can do multitask training by bootstrapping on um, curricula over simpler tasks. So for action spaces, we normally, for DM Lab, have um, a number of degrees of freedom of how an agent can move. You can um, rotate at various angles. You can move up and down, um, which if you sort of fa take a factorized action space of all these dimensions, you have more than 700 possible actions, which often makes training quite slow. And so we, what we choose to do in this curriculum is we start by training the agent on some subset of the actions. So it's only allowed to use nine actions. Um, and we progressively mix and match such that the agent learns to use 700 actions. Um, so this is what the architecture looks like. We share a lot of the, the layers and only have two different policy heads. Um, and you can see here that while the small action space learns um, to a subhuman level of performance, um, the big action space gets to better performance, but is even slower to train. Whereas if you do mix and match on the subset of levels, you can get to um, above human performance. Um, I think what's happening here is you don't just get the max of the two, but because you can explore with the smaller action space, it makes the exploration problem much easier, leading to significant boosts. Um, we can also look at this density estimation of how the agent is using the actions. And you can see on the leftmost slice, the agent goes from using just a few actions in time to using almost 700 actions by the end of training. Um, we can do a similar thing with scaling agent architectures. Um, so again, we would like to train this LSTM-based agent because a lot of these levels involve memory. Um, and we can start by training a feedforward value function and policy and bootstrapping on that to then finally train this mixture between a feedforward and LSTM. Um, so one thing that's interesting to look at is how this curriculum actually progresses. Um, and I've plotted here for, for k equals 2 for these two, um, this mixture between feedforward and LSTM, the values of alpha um, for various games. Um, and you can see that with PBT, we do just find uh, these schedules where sometimes it's very good to start with using a feedforward model, switch in the middle a few times, but eventually all the agents um, move to using an LSTM. What's important to note as well is we don't have any um, conditions on this alpha. We don't force it to go towards one, but uh, a sort of natural curriculum is found by, by the training regime. 
Um, lastly, we look at multitask training. So here, what we want to do is we have these three levels, um, two of which are laser tag levels, um, and have a fundamentally um, sort of different set of policies that are optimal from a navigation level. Um, and so when you train them together, you get this, this red curve where essentially you lose performance on some of the levels because of destructive interference between the tasks. And so what we do is we try mix and match for this um, task. So we want only one multitask policy finally. And we start by creating separate policy heads for the individual tasks just to bootstrap during training. And so you can see these two plots here, which are the dotted line and the solid line, um, show you how this mix and match policy um, evolves through training for various values of alpha. Um, and you can sort of increase the performance and reduce this destructive interference by the inductive bias in, in this algorithm. Um, so in conclusion, it's often a good idea with DeepRL to employ curricula not just over tasks, um, but often over agents when it's difficult to create such curricula over tasks. Um, if you can, then you should do both. Um, mix and match is one possible general purpose way of doing this, um, and I encourage you to use it if it seems like a good fit. To hear more, come to poster number 13 in Hall B uh, this evening. Thank you. Any question? Hi, uh, nice talk. So I was wondering, is there a formal definition for what makes one agent more complex than another? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So there isn't. I think this is why we tried to give sort of a few examples of what we meant, because I think it just depends on the training regime. Um, sort of what we mean is when one agent is less data efficient. So if you expect an agent that will get final better performance but is much slower or, or far less data efficient on a frame-by-frame -frame basis, um, then maybe it makes sense to train some simplified version of that agent first. Um, so in the case of both the larger action spaces and the LSTM, there is both intuitively but also empirically an advantage to using them because you get better final performance and you get a more expressive agent, um, but it significantly reduces the data efficiency. Um, so, you know, if you had something that was more data efficient but also better performing, I don't think you'd necessarily want to speed that up. You could. Um, but this is more for the cases where there is an agent that's somewhat more difficult to train while still giving you better performance. Hello, hi. Um, so my question is, um, can you give a bit of motivation as to why you uh, chose to mix the, um, the policies in this way? You could also be mixing the values or some sort of embeddings. So yeah. uh, why is that a good idea? Uh, yeah, good question. So um, we linked to some related work with Distral, where they do um, also um, mix in logic space. Um, we thought there was a good semantic uh, definition if you mixed in policy space, because you, you could sort of um, compare how much of each policy was being used. We also do mix in value space. So um, for the feedforward model, we do both policy and value. Um, in, yeah, in, in general, um, there was a, a sort of more bounded value of alpha if you mix in the policy space, because it's bounded between zero and one, and that sort of helps the semantics of how of doing PBT with it. Um, but no, I think there's many possible alternatives. And many extensions include mixing in sort of embedding space lower down and hoping that the agent learns which pathway to use. Um, it just seems that there was something about the inductive bias of mixing in the final layers that helped performance when we tried it. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank the speaker. So the last talk of the session is learning to explore via meta policy gradient and is presented by Tian Bing Zhu. everyone. My name is Tian Bing. I'm from Baidu Research at California. Uh, today, I would like to introduce our work, Learning to Explore via Meta Policy Gradient. This is a collaborative work with Chang Liu from UT Austin, Liang Zhao from Baidu, and Jian Peng from URUC. Uh, first, I would like to show some of our running uh, results for two continuous control tasks. The first one is uh, inverted double pendulum. This is a, a highly uh, unstable dynamic system. Our meta-exploration method is able to successfully learn, uh, uh, learn a controller to stabilize and uh, um, stabilize the system. This is another example from the pendulum. 
it is also able to successfully learn a controller. So the basic idea is uh, we, can, we can regard our world, our idea as a teacher-student exploration and exploitation interactions. So assume we have two agents. The teacher agent, it has the exploration policy. Uh, it is learning to generate high quality data based on students' performance improvement. Can you put it in the presentation mode? Oh, sorry. Uh, full screen. Okay. Last one, last one. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So the student uh, is a uh, student agent that has an uh, expectation policy. It is basically learning from the teacher's demonstration to improve its performance. So uh, every time the teacher uh, generates action, the action is just a set of uh, uh, trajectories generated. Uh, from the exploration policy, based on this uh, action D0, this is data, the student is able to update its uh, policy to the next uh, state, and uh, it will introduce the meta reward. So this is the uh, entire, like the interaction process. So how we define the meta reward? The meta reward is defined as the student performance improvement. It is just the difference of the two policy evaluation one policy is a look at the policy of a student. That's just uh, our prediction of the uh, policy, student policy, based on the current st student uh, policy and the data generated by the exploration policy. And uh, so another uh, re re reward is uh, just the Monte Carlo estimate of the current policy. So. We, for, simple, for simplicity, we just evaluated the, the policy using the Monte Carlo estimation of the trajectory. So the teachers, so we introduced how we learn to exploration by the teacher. So teacher actually, the objective is to improve the meta reward of the student. So it's the expectation of the meta reward with respect to the distribution of the uh, exploration policy. Uh, by the simple reinforce uh, trick, we are able to calculate, estimate the teacher's uh, policy gradient. We call it a meta policy gradient. It, is, uh, it has two paths. The first path is a score function. It's a, a, it's a, a gradient of the log likelihood of the exploration trajectory. The second path is a meta reward. So intuitively, the uh, we just uh, the improve the gradient is on the direction of the score function with the um, magnitude magnitude of the meta reward. So if we have better student performance improvement, we are just uh, move far along the score function grad gradient direction. Now we just uh, in detail we introduce the learning to explore algorithm for the teacher. So the teacher first uh, generate uh, the uh, trajectory d zero by executing its exploration policy, then the student is able to update its current policy to a look ahead policy based on this data. Now we are able to estimate the meta reward. Uh, it's just the difference between two policy evaluation or two policy performance. One is the look ahead policy, another is the current policy. Uh, given the meta reward, we are able to estimate the policy gradient. That's the meta policy gradient. And we are able to update the parameter uh, for the network, policy network, exploration policy network. And in order to improve the sample efficiency, we just add uh, both data, D0 and D1. D1 is generated from the look ahead policy and into the replay buffer. Given this repeated buffer, we are able to update the student policy to the next policy using some like the all policy, policy updater like the DDPG. Then the algorithm continues. Now I introduce our experimental, extensive experimental result uh, for six control tasks, continuous control tasks. Uh, for like the classical control, for example, the inverted double pendulum, and uh, the Majuko control task, like the Hooper and the half cheetah. 
First, we show that uh, our meta exploration is able to explore efficiently uh, with higher sample efficiency and the return. So basically, we have three architecture design for the meta policy, like the exploration policy. So first one is just uh, we use different uh, uh, mean network compared to the student policy and uh, use an uh, independent uh, covariance matrix. And uh, uh, because in order to like the uh, tracking the internal state, we also add some like the Q function related features into this meta. So we call it meta state. The third choice is that uh, we just trying to adapt it to the covariance matrix. So the mean network is the same as the student policy, while the covariance is just uh, uh, we are learning the covariance. So because the primary space uh, uh, exploration is very sensitive for the, for the variance, so we just able to try to learn the variance adaptively. So for the, this result, Compare, we are compared with the DDPG baseline. For this result, uh, it is obvious that uh, our meta is able to achieve significant uh, better sample efficiency and returns. So this is the result for the six continuous control tasks. So the x axis is the number of steps, thousands of steps of interactions between the policy and uh, the environment. Y axis is uh, return number. For each experiment, we just uh, uh, use three random seeds to plot the mean return and the confidence interval. For, uh, we have pretty good results for the inverted double pendulum uh, task and also for the pendulum and the inverted pendulum. This is uh, detailed numbers comparison with the DDPG baseline. So uh, in, mo in the most tasks, actually, we have better numbers. For example, for the invert double pendulum, we have near 8,000 uh, score compared to near 3,000 scores for DDPG. To better understand uh, the interaction, interactive behavior between teacher and the students for the student for the exploration and the exploitation, we plot the state of visita visitation density contours of our meta policy and uh, the baseline DDPG in two learning stage. One is a very early stage, and the other is a, is a very late stage. So first, we can see that we have a very, uh, the exploration, the teacher explore very different uh, state space compared to the DDPG baseline. It is non-locally exploration, so we call it uh, global exploration. The second, uh, we found that uh, the teacher actually is able to explore very wide range and uh, with diverse distributions and uh, across different modes. So it will actually will help uh, the student to learning. Finally, we found that uh, it is uh, interactive uh, exploration. So the teacher continues to provide, provide, provide the high quality data to the student and the student uh, is just improve its uh, policy continuously. In conclusion, we have developed a meta-learning algorithm for uh, exploration. And uh, the exploration is guided uh, by teacher with diverse and adaptive policies. The teacher is able to explore the state space globally, which means it is far from the student states. Uh, if you have further questions, please come to my poster at uh, 113. Thanks very much. There's a question over there. Yeah, hi, over here. Okay. Um, I have two questions. So first, um, the reward, like the teacher is actually acting greedily, if I understand correctly. It's just trying to optimize the improvement of in performance, like in the next step. Uh, teacher is just trying to uh, improve the student's performance. And uh, that is a student performance improvement. That means, uh, for example, if a teacher just uh, provided some data, D0, to the, to the student, so how the student is able to improve its performance, then yeah. we just evaluate it as a difference of two policy. Right, the first but this is only uh, in one, like one step ahead, right? You're not trying to see how can I teach the student now so that in 10 steps 
it will have better reward. Yeah, that's a good idea. So in our implementation, actually, we only use one step ahead, but we use multiple trajectories. Yeah. OK, and yeah. then the other question was, what is the, uh, the teacher actually looking at in terms of its state or observation? Like, does it uh, look at the current student's policy somehow? Or uh, does it uh, have any state? Oh, yeah, that's a good input? question. Yeah, teacher actually, yeah, it depends on the student uh, state. We call, actually, student uh, state is a pi, is a student uh, policy. It's an internal state. And also, there are some like the algorithmic state, like some, like the, the MDP state, S, and the MDT actions. We can just uh, like the incorporate them into the Q function. So actually, teacher depends on these kind of states. So that's why we actually here use the meta state. So the, the, the teacher is going to see all of the parameters of the student's policy. Yeah, because the teacher is dependent on student policy. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, with this, uh, the reinforcement session number 14 comes to an end. Thank you all for attending and uh, thank you all the speakers. Let's thank all the speakers and end the session. Thank you. Bye bye.